بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن شاء الله تعالى today we're going to be speaking about a very brief topic إن شاء الله تعالى and it's the topic of Jam'u uh, al-Mushaf um, The joining of the Mushaf The writing of the Qur'an The writing of the Qur'an And as we know as Muslims The book that was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the Qur'an And uh, the other revelation that was related to him is the Sunnah With regards to knowledge then the Muslims are, are upon the belief that the Qur'an is what they call al-mastar al-awwal the first source for Islamic legislation and that the Sunnah is al-mastar al-thani is the second source of Islamic legislation but when we say that it is the second source of Islamic legislation we do not mean that it's the second source of legislation in that it is lower than the Qur'an no it is on the same level with the Qur'an, but the Qur'an was revealed first. The Qur'an was revealed first, and therefore it is the first source of legislation numerically, not in terms of quwa, not in terms of strength. Meaning, if there is something in the Qur'an, we use the Sunnah to explain it. Or if there is something in the Qur'an, which there is a particular ayah, and there is a hadith where the Prophet wasallam interpreted it, to be a particular way which may seem to oppose what the ayah is saying then we go with what the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith because the Qur'an and Sunnah are on the same level in terms of يعني, in terms of um, in terms of divinity and in terms of يعني, strength it's not, يعني, it's not the case that we have the Qur'an and Sunnah and we say that the Sunnah is less than the Qur'an which is why, which is why يعني, and it's just a side point, it's nothing to do with the lecture that uh, when the scholars ask, you know, uh, Can the Sunnah, can the Qur'an be abrogated by the Sunnah? Then yes, it can be. But there isn't an example where that happened. But theoretically it could happen because the Sunnah is on par with the Qur'an in terms of, in terms of um, legislative power. So with regard to the Qur'an, the writing of the Qur'an, the Qur'an was written down in three stages. Thalathu marahil, three stages. The first stage of the writing of the Qur'an was in the time of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fi ahd al In the time of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And at this time, the writing of the Qur'an was very little. The writing of the Qur'an was very little. And the reason behind this is because the Arabs, generally speaking, were not an ummah, were not a people who wrote things down. They were not a group of people who what? Who wrote things down. So when you go to other yani, parts of the world, you find that the Romans wrote things down. The Romans wrote things down. They wrote things down in the Latin script, which they got from, if I'm correct, it has some similarities to the Greek script. If not, um, if, I'm, if my memory serves me correct, it is the Greek script that the, that the Romans took and turned it into the Latin script. Um, if you go to uh, the Romans, had a form of writing, which then spread to all of Western Europe, Eastern Europe, and you know the story goes on from there. If you go to places such as China, you find that the Chinese had a script. The Chinese had a script of writing. If you go to India, you find that the ancient language of Sanskrit was a form of writing and if you go to other parts of other parts of the yani, so subcontinent you find that there are other forms of writing if you go to ancient Egypt you find that they had hieroglyphics uh, yani, a form of writing and uh, one of the oldest forms of writing also which predates Islam for example is uh, 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 Ethiopia as well they had their own uh, script yani, you have the Tuareq writing the writing of the Tuareq people um, but then after in other parts of the world, for example in black Africa, there generally wasn't writing. The people there did not write. Like the Arabs, they, was, they just didn't write. 
which is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Jum'ah, He, it is He, i.e. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who sent to the Ummiyun, to the unlettered people, yani the people who are not literate, illiterate people, Rasula, a messenger. And the reason why يعني, they say uh, Allah, they, they say linguistically in the Arabic language why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why the Arabs they call a um, a person who cannot read Ummi is because, and it has similarities to the word Umm, which means mother, is because huwa kama يعني, ummuhu. He is as if he's in the same state that his mother gave birth to him in. He's as if his mother gave birth to him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, Allahu akhrajukum min batuni ummahatikum la ta'alamun shay'a. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused you to come out from the wombs of your mother. Mothers, la ta'alamun shay'a. You didn't know anything. La ta'alamun shay'a. You did not know anything. This is, when Allah says shay'a, yani in usul, in usul fiqh, this means this is something which is aam. Shay'a, yani you didn't know anything. Nothing at all. And even in the Arabic language, the word shay is the يعني, شيء is the most general word you can ever bring. Like saying the word thing or يعني, شيء, uh, you didn't know, not even one thing you didn't know as a baby. So, which is, which is why the baby, everything he does is, is extinctive. He doesn't do anything out of, out of knowledge. He doesn't do anything out of ilm. Even when, يعني, when, when he goes for the leba, which is the first kind of uh, uh, breast milk, that a baby drinks, يعني, it's called a leather, the thick breast milk, before the normal breast milk comes out. This is done from something which is fitri. It's done from the, it's inanimate within the child. Allah has created the child to do it like that. But it doesn't do it an ilm, it doesn't do it from knowledge. It doesn't cry because of ilm, that he knows that if he cries, he's going to get what he wants in the beginning. He cries because that's just his heart that Allah made him. So he has no ilm. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, or when, Allah, when the Arabs used to say that a person is ummi, he's, يعني, he's, as, يعني, he's uh, illiterate, it's as if uh, يعني, he is born the way, uh, he, it's as if he is born in a state that his mother has given birth to him. يعني, which is why Allah just said the Arab, which said, وَالَّذِي بَعْثِ فِي أُمِّيِّنَا رَسُولًا So this was the hal in the time of Prophet the first uh, when he was around, when he was living with the companions, the majority of people did not write. Yani, al ala al kitab qalil. Yani, people that used to rely on writing, it was that was not the case. The case was that people used to rely on oral tradition, oral tradition, which is why anyone who knew something was not known as an alim. This word came after Islam spread. After Islam spread, the word alim came, or the word shaykh. Before that, anybody who has some knowledge was known as like a qari, he can read. Rajulun qari, a person who can read. But they never used to say, يعني, rajulun alim. This man is a alim. They never used to say that. Rajul qari. This man is a, someone who can read, not someone who is a, يعني, a alim. So in this time, the people didn't, they never used to generally speaking read, okay? They generally uh, uh, never used to read. And when the companions of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, when they would write down things, يعني, before I even get into that, they couldn't read and يعني, as the ulama say, even وَسَائِلُ الْكِتَابَ لَمْ تَكُنْ مَوْجُودًا يعني, Even the means to write wasn't even there. It, was, it wasn't like they had paper. If you go to other countries at the same time, and that many other empires, you have people who have scribes, people to write. Even the wasail, the means for you to write, were not really mawjood. Paper or scribes or parchment. They never used to write that much, so even the thought to create the utensils that write, yani, were not, uh, 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 yani, they were not uh, rife within the society. So, when the Prophet was uh, reciting the Quran, uh, some of his companions would write things down. Some of his companions would write things down. Those people who wrote it down, they wrote things down on يعني, parchments of uh, leaves. They would write it down on stones, small white stones. They would write it, some, يعني, some يعني, say that they wrote it on bones and, and other things like that. And يعني, 
when it came to writing the Quran in the very beginning, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi allowed for his yani, companions to write down the Quran. Which is why the Prophet sallallahu alaihi said in the Hadith, لا تكتبوا عني ومن كتب عني غير القرآن فليمحب يعني don't write anything that I say. This is what he said, except for the Quran. So, when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is teaching the companions about the rulings of the religion. He would say, if you're going to write anything, write down the Qur'an. Don't write down my words. Because he did not want the companions to mix his words with the Qur'an. So what we get from here, from, from what we get from this, uh, this hadith, is that the companions of Prophet ﷺ, they used to write down the Qur'an. They used to write down the Qur'an. So, yani, this uh, had carried on. One of the first problems in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where the need to write down the Qur'an may have become apparent in the time is when a group of people known as the Qurra the people of the Qur'an and people who could read the Qur'an and memorize the Qur'an when they were killed and يعني, a man called Abu Bara ibn Malik came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he lived يعني, far away from al Madina in the middle region of um, the Arabian Peninsula and he said you know أرسل معنا أناس من القراء يعلمون الناس القرآن send people okay send people uh, uh, with, to, with us to our people who know the Quran so they can teach the Quran and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said فقال إني أخشى عليهم من فجار نجد that I am scared that if I send people to this mintaqa, to this area that you say you want uh, them to go to teach the people of Quran I fear that يعني, the bandits of Najd, يعني, the criminals of Najd will kill these people يعني, he was scared that they will be killed the man said no, don't worry, it's fine I am their jiwar, I am their neighbor and in those times يعني, to be a neighbor was a big thing, يعني, to respect your neighbor Basically giving his word, you have my word, these people will not be killed. So the Prophet وسلم, sent يعني, the Qurra there. When they arrived at this place, يعني, they were killed by the bandits. The Prophet وسلم, said, uh, I'm, I'm fearful, and they were killed. And 70 of these people were killed. يعني. 70 of the Qurra, 70 people who memorized the Quran were killed. So at this moment, يعني, it's becoming apparent to the society that يعني, the Qur'an needs to be written down. Even though it's already being written down, the fact that only more wars are going to take place يعني, showed us or uh, showed the people of that society at that time in al Medina the need to write down the Qur'an. And there were many people who, who uh, يعني, in the time, or many major companions of Prophet Muhammad or the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, who memorized the Quran. And يعني, from them was Salim Mawla Abi Hudayfa. He was a well-known يعني, companion uh, who يعني, memorized the Quran. You have Mu'adh ibn Jabal, who was uh, يعني, who Mu'adh ibn Jabal was, was, was of course, Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam sent Mu'adh ibn Jabal to Yemen, sent him to Yemen to give the people da'wah to Islam. Uh, you have also then Abdullah bin Mas'ud who is يعني, Tarjuman al-Qur'an uh, Abdullah bin Mas'ud who is يعني, a great companion and alim of, of, from the Sahabas Zayd ibn Thabit or Abu Darda those are some of the names of those people who يعني, understood and يعني, uh, memorized the Qur'an from the Qur'an as we said uh, when people memorized uh, it's not it was not necessary it was يعني, they did not live at a time when um, people read or write. So if these people are killed, if these companions are killed in battle, خلاص, the Quran may leave. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ended up dying. يعني, and he died Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he was buried in al Medina. and the companions elected or يعني, chose, shall I say, Abu Bakr uh, to lead them. In, as, as a khilafah, when Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was ill, he said, Muru ala Bakrin for yisalli bin nas, uh, order Abu Bakr to come so he can lead the people in salah. So from there, they say that he is the most pious from amongst us. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam chose them, chose him to lead them in salat, 
which shows that he is the best from them. Um, so he became the Khilafah. When he became the Khilafah, there was a harb known as Harb al Yamama, the wars of Al Yamama, and يعني, it was the wars of in the in the middle region of uh, of, of the Arabian Peninsula. Um, you could say where the Yalb and these kind of places are today in modern times. This is where Al Yamama uh, was. يعني, وسط البلد. Najd. Najd is Al Yamama, or most of Najd is in Al Yamama. So, يعني, these people they became Muslim. I mean, they 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 they. they ارتدوا بعد موت النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم. They became kufar after the death of Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم. Okay. And um, في سنة الثانية عشرة من الهجرة يعني البادر في جمع المصحف. In the year twelve after the hijra, the, the year twelve of the Islamic calendar after the hijra of Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم, Abu Bakr uh, engaged in uh, in uh, writing the mushaf because after the death after these wars of Al Yamama, many of the companions died. Yani many of the companions died. Um, the companion, one of the companions who died, was a companion that we just said earlier. Yani Al Salim Mawla Abu, yani Mawla Abu Hudayfa, or Mawla Abi Hudayfa, Afwan. He died. Yani in this war, so many yani people died. So Umar anhu went to Abu Bakr. Uh, and ordered him, you know, or not ordered him, advised him to يعني, join the Mus'haf, uh, to write down the Mus'haf. And Abu Bakr was reluctant because the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not order it, did not يعني, order the writing of the Prophet Muhammad of writing or writing the Quran. So he did not want to introduce something which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam didn't do. Which is a delil, the fa'idah in that, the fa'idah in that يعني, point in and of itself is that we are a, a, a ummah of, of ittiba, of following. يعني, we're not an ummah of uh, tahdith or يعني, insha, bringing things from new. We are ummah of following. يعني, okay? قُلْ إِنْ, قل إن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِ Say, so if you believe in Allah, then follow me. I.e. follow Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We're not an ummah of when after Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam died, he said, okay, what he did was khayr, we're going to open up our own tariqa, our own Sufi tariqa, or this or that, and we're going to turn off the lights and we're going to say, Allahu, 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 or something like that. No, we are an ummah of following the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, Abu Bakr uh, is saying, I do not want to do this. And Umar is يعني, doing يعني, al-ilhah, is constantly insisting to Abu Bakr that you need to write down the Quran not just for any reason but because of al haja da'at al haja ila dhalik the need for it the need calls for that particular thing we have to do this yani we're not just doing anything for the sake of doing it we're doing it because of a haja because of a need okay and Abu Bakr radiyallahu anhu finally decides to do it and the fact that Abu Bakr decided to do it shows us that writing down the Mus'haf was not a bid'ah. Because if it was an, a bid'ah, he would never have done it. And a bid'ah is something which is introduced in the religion. So the reason why Abu Bakr didn't do it was wara'an, from the minbab al wara'. He did it by way of trying to be so God fearing, he didn't even want to fall into something which may be a mistake. Not that it was a mistake, but the fact that it may be a mistake, he didn't do that. We can see that because if it was something which is haram, the companions would never do anything which is haram. يعني الصحابة كلهم عدول. All of the companions are truthful. It's a qa'idah in the religion. الصحابة كلهم عدول. All the companions are, يعني, are um, truthful. We don't believe the companions to be liars, people who make things up in the religion. So the fact that Abu Bakr decides to do it shows that, the, that, that it is halal. And also the Prophet ﷺ said to the companions to write it. If you send the people to write it, then it's halal. But maybe the issue that they had uh, يعني, an issue with was jam, was to bring it all together. Anyway, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, now that he, uh, he has decided to do it, he wants to call somebody to write down the Quran. 
Those he brings somebody who write down the Quran. So he calls, يعني يعني زيد بن ثابت. He calls Zayd ibn Thabit to write down the Quran. And Zayd ibn Thabit was an illustrious Sahaba who used to write down the Quran from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And he said, "In in, يعني إنك رجل شاب. Indeed, you are a young man." عاقل يا صنبت who has a يعني عقل أن لا تنهمق وقد كنت تكتب الوحي لرسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. You are a young man, trustworthy person, and you used to write down the wahi in the time of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. And the fact that that he used to write down the wahi, the يعني the the Revelation of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the Quran in the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam lifetime, and the Prophet allowed that necessitates that he can do it after the death of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Does anybody know? Just before we move on, does anybody know any other companion who was very poor and he used to write down the Wahi, and then he became something very big? Does anybody know? Any Sahabi, he was poor to the point where the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said. He's, when a woman said, I want to marry one of three people, and the Prophet ﷺ said, don't write, him, don't write it down because he's Sa'luk, he has nothing. In, in the Arabic language, Sa'luk means this man has not even a penny, not even a penny. And then he became something big, you wouldn't even imagine. Does anybody have an idea of who that person is? Anybody? Abu Huraira. No, Mu'awiyah. Mu'awiyah. Mu'awiyah radiallahu anhu became a mashallah a khilaf of the Muslims and he was a he mashallah and Prophet said this man is Saluk he has no money when he was a, when Prophet was alive and after after the death of Prophet he became the khilaf hmm? he had he, and he was a khilaf of the Muslims a, a, a man a military power prowess and a leader and a great Muslim hmm? So it is a delil that even if you're nothing now, if a person maybe feels like they have nothing now, until that time for the mustaqbal, you don't know what's going to happen in the in the future. You may become something, mashallah, very successful. What the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said about, yani, Muawiyah was saluk. He has not even any money, and he used to write down the wahi. He used to write down the the Quran from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he became something big. So you don't know, maybe you, you might think to yourself right now, I'm miskeen, I don't know anything. أنت لا تدري ماذا سيحصل في المستقبل. You don't know what's going to happen in the future. Anyway, we'll turn back to the topic. We'll turn back to the topic. So, Zayd ibn Thabit, he writes down the Qur'an. He brings the Qur'an. Okay? And he gathers the Qur'an. فجمع القرآن يعني من اللخاف. يعني from, يعني from leaves. Okay? Well, uh, well, no, الخاف يعني from uh, يعني stones, white stones, okay. والعصب and from يعني uh, uh, leaves and من صدور الرجال from the chests of men or the companions. He goes to the companions and he gathers the Quran. وجمع المسلمون في عهد أبي أبي بكر على ذلك. And the Muslims in that particular time, there was ittifaq. There was ittifaq. أجمع المسلمون على ما فعله أبو بكر رضي الله عنه. All of the companions, there was ittifaq upon them. There was no disagreement. There was no disagreement in what Abu Bakr رضي الله عنه did. Okay. So Abu Bakr رضي الله عنه, you know, his khilaf was short. Two years and a bit, and he dies, and is buried next to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And after that, Umar radiallahu anhu, he becomes khilafa. Umar radiallahu anhu, in his time, there is so many futuhat, there is so many um, great uh, expansions of the Muslim state that we spoke about last week at Sham. That he keeps this Quran, but he doesn't add anything to it. He keeps the Quran, and he gives it to his daughter Hafsa. He gave it to his daughter, Hafsa, to speak, uh, to, to keep. And Umar radiallahu anhu, he dies. The reason why, uh, if I will get to that again. Okay. And then we come to, and that was Marhala to Thani, that is the second uh, uh, stage. Then we get to Marhala to Thalitha, the third stage. And it is the, yani, the, um, the Khilafah of Uthman 
رضي الله عنه the khilaf of Uthman رضي الله عنه and Uthman as we all know is one of the greatest companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he is from يعني, uh, Banu Umayyah he's from one of the high high tribes of Al Quraysh and he married يعني, the daughters of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so in the year 25 after Hijrah now 25 years have passed since the Hijrah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and that is the start of the Muslim calendar the start of the Muslim calendar when they wanted to ask when the Muslims uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a'atahum shawka fil ard when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them strength in the earth they asked themselves okay well we want to make a calendar when should our calendar start when should the calendar of the Muslims start يعني? and the Muslims they decided to make the start of their calendar the year that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made hijrah to al Madinah. the year that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made hijrah so when we say that the year is going to be 1441 that it means 1000 when it becomes that year 1441 years since the hijrah of who of the message of allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so in the year 25 after the death of the message of allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the people now is al islam يعني, Islam has now spread to different villages and to different cities and now Islam is in Asham, is in certain parts of Asham, Islam is in Iraq, Islam is in is in Persia. Now the Persians are starting to speak Arabic slowly. Uh, Islam is in Egypt. Uh, and in certain parts of North Africa. So يعني, Islam is spreading. Islam is spreading. And uh, the people who are now coming becoming Muslim, uh, they they are becoming Arab min يعني, لسانا, وليس عرقا. They're becoming Arab by way of their lisan, by way of their tongue, not by way of their blood. And because of the fact that they are becoming uh, Arab by way of language and their mother tongue was not Arab. Uh, they say that they were making mistakes in some of their kalam. They were making mistakes in some of their kalam. So if one person looked at the sky and said, how beautiful is the sky? They'll say, you're supposed to say when you do fi'l ta'ajjub ma ajmal as how beautiful is the sky? And rather than saying ma ajmal as they'll say ma ajmal as is a mistake. It's a mistake, yani. you're, When you say ma ajmal as you mean how beautiful is the sky? Ma ajmal as If you say ma ajmal as you're saying what does the sky make beautiful? What makes the sky beautiful? And then after one person said nujumwa, the 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 stars, which is why a year after Uthman, we'll get back to the story. A year after Uthman, radiyallahu anhu, I mean after Uthman takes the khilafa, yani. Ali bin Abi Talib orders the the يعني, the codification of the Arabic language. He orders that the rules and the way the Arabic language is spoken is to be preserved so that Islam can be understood and preserved. And he orders Abu Aswad al Duali, he orders him to write down the first um, uh, rules of the Arabic language. So this is why when, people, when a person wants to uh, study Islam, he needs to understand Nahu, uh, part of the Arabic language. So anyway, we go back to Uthman. Uthman radiallahu anhu, um, he wants to write down the Mus'haf because people, they're reciting the Quran differently. And there is ikhtilaf with the people. There is ikhtilaf, they're different with the people. And like we said to you before, new people are becoming Muslims, so new people are speaking English. Uh, speaking Arabic and when you look at English for example when you look at how English has spread to different places in the world you find that depending on where they speak they speak their language differently the changes take place the more a language travels with people the language uh, changes so that's the same way with Arabic yani the language was changing and the language needed to be preserved because they were not an ummah who used to read or write so now that this, that this Muslim empire is becoming bigger and bigger they need to write down their language. And an example of that in, 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 in modern terms is English. 
American English and British English are, are different. Maybe because people watch TV, they think that American English is similar because we grow up. But if you live with an American, Allah, his English is different. In the Jamia, when if, if some of American brothers that I've been with, the way in which they speak English, they say, this, I say to them, this, this English is different. When they hear us speak English, they become scared because they say, SubhanAllah, look at the joda of your kalam, look at how well you speak English. When the English brothers just sit down and talk, they think, SubhanAllah, these guys. And I said to me, yeah, English in Britain is the um. <laughs> England, is this is where the English language comes from. And I'm the um. And people are the children, and they speak it differently. <coughs> so, for example, in English, you'll say the year 2005. They'll say the year 2005. They take away the and. But the English people, they say 2005. But in America, 2005, the year 2018, 2019. In British English, 2019. So just like that, when, when the Arabic uh, language was spreading, uh, people spoke Arabic differently and there was ikhtilaf in the Quran. And because of this, Rasulullah radiallahu anhu, he wanted to, yani, he wanted to speak, uh, he wanted to uh, stop this khilaf. يَخْرُجُ مِنَ الْخِلَافِ He wanted to stay away from this khilaf. So what did he do? He ordered the writing down of the Mus'haf in one lisan. The lisan of Quraysh. The lisan of Quraysh. Uh, the, the tongue of Quraysh. Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam كَانَ نَبِيًّا يعني قُرَشِيًّا he was, a, he was a Nabi from the Quraysh. And the Quraysh, the Arabic is أَفْصَحُ الْكَلَامِ It's the most clearest and the most uh, the most يعني, eloquent of all speech of the Arabs. Therefore, he يعني, uh, عنه, wanted the Quran to be يعني, written in the Qurayshi dialect or in the Qurayshi tongue. Because the Prophet was Qurayshi and that which he recited was Qurayshi. Now, the reason why I say that is because in the Arabic language, the Arabic that most people speak today is the Qurayshi Arabic, even in different parts of the language. Um, different parts of the world, majority of the companions who left were from Mecca and Medina. Major, a lot of them, the Muhajirun, they were Qurayshi. So even just the Hijazi dialect spread. If you read the old books of language, you find Arabic which is never used anymore. It's not used at all anymore. Uh, the, you know, the Lugha of this, of Bani Kadha, the Lugha of Bani Kadha, the Lugha of this tribe, the Lugha of that tribe. Arabic was very varied. Arabic was very, very, very different. Yeah, I mean, some people spoke Arabic very different. They could all understand one another, but it was varied. But the clearest and the and the I mean, the highest of all lughat in that time was the lugha of uh, yeah, I mean, of um, the Quraysh. So yeah, I mean, what happened was was that Islam spread to certain countries. Okay, Islam spread to many countries. And when, when Uthman, عنه, when he opened Armenia, Armenia, and Armenia now is a Catholic country, it's not a Muslim country, it's an Orthodox Christian country. The Muslims opened Armenia, they ruled Armenia, they ruled Armenia, Armenia for some time, and Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan, that people know today, which they have, they're not religious, they don't follow any religion, but if they're, they'll tell you traditionally we are Shia, it became a Shia place. It became a Shia place, uh, Azerbaijan. They call it now Azerbaijan, it's Azerbaijan. And when, uh, and this is just right next to I mean, Europe, or it's just the lower part of Europe. I don't know if you want to consider it Asia or, or, or Europe. Ala kulli hal, Hudayf ibn Yaman says to Uthman, you know, people are dying in war, some of the companions are dying in war, people are dying in war. We need to, and people are reciting يعني, different Qur'an, the, 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 the Quran differently, and this is only going to get worse. It's not going to get any better. More and more people are becoming Muslim. We need to preserve the Arabic language. We're not with this, uh, uh, preserving it because we think that we're better than anybody else, or some people are they have this, they have this hatred for, for Arab people. You know, some people they just hate Arabs. You know because of what they see today. Don't make your hatred of Arabs or, or don't make your hatred of anyone or something that you see today. The companion of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they 
So who is the Prophet Allah Alaihi Wasallam? Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala He sent the Quran in Arab. Inna Inna Anzalna Quran in Arabiya. We sent this Quran in Arabic. You don't have to get angry. I mean, some people they get angry at everything. So they joined the Mus'haf. They brought the Mus'haf together in the Qurayshi dialect, so that people can recite the Quran properly, and that when Islam spreads to people and the Muslims take over a place. When it's time to teach the people Quran, when they become Muslim, we have a Quran that we can give them. It's not every single person is writing a Quran or, or saying a different Quran. So, uh, Uthman radiallahu anhu, he asked Hafsa, when we said before that Umar radiallahu anhu, she, he, he left the Mus'haf of Abu Bakr with Hafsa, he asked Hafsa to bring the Mus'haf. Hafsa brings him the mus Mus'haf and, yani, uh, Uthman orders Zayd ibn Thabit to write it down, okay, uh, and um, uh, Abdullah, Abdullah ibn Zayd, uh, Zayd to write it down, and Sa'id ibn al-As to write it down, and Abdurrahman ibn Harith ibn Hisham. He asked these companions to write down the Quran, and they write down the Quran. The difference between uh, Abu Bakr writing down the Mus'haf was because he wanted to do taqeed of the Mus'haf. He wanted to write. He wanted to write down what is the mushaf, in the sense where he wanted to gather everything. So if somebody else says Allah uh, Taala and it's not the Quran, you can say no. This is not the Quran. The Quran is what we have. We know that this is the Quran. What you're saying is something else. So he did it. يعني ليقيد المصحف to write down that which is the Quran. So we say okay, this is the Quran and this is not the Quran. So جامع مانع. It's something which is compiled every the Quran and anything which is not the Quran, we take it away. The reason for Uthman radiallahu anhu to to write down the to write down the Mus'haf um, was for to to stop the khilaf with the Muslims, to stop the khilaf and to make them recite the Quran properly, because people were reciting the Quran in different ways. So he uh, 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 so he yani Uthman radiallahu anhu. He wrote down the he, he ordered that the Quran be written down to stop يعني, يعني to take the people out of khilaf, out of difference of opinion. So this is the qissa of how the companions uh, عنهم, wrote down the Quran. And subhanAllah the Quran is, a, is an illustrious book, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to memorize the Quran. Some forward of this story, some of the benefits of this story. We could say is hujjiyatul, uh, hujjiyatul, um, the hujjiyah of uh, ijma, of ijma. The fact that ijma is uh, in the religion is a delil and shari. You have two kinds of uh, you have you have different types of delil in Islam. Two different types of evidence. The first kind of evidence is the Quran. We take it. The second form of evidence is the Sunnah. We take it. The third kind of uh, uh, um, uh, of delil. Is what al ijma, and we take it. I'm going to give us what ijma is, and the fourth is al qiyas. Al ijma is the agreement of Muslims. اتفاق علماء أهل عصر على حكم حاد على حكم أو على حكم حادثة يعني أو اتفاق علماء أهل عصر على حكم حادث يعني it is for it is the agreement of all Muslim scholars on something which has happened. Meaning, if something has happened, an incident has happened, and there's a problem, and all the ulama come together and say, this is halal, this is haram, and they all unanimously agree that it's haram for us to go to leave that ittifaq. It is haram for us to what? To leave that, to leave that agreement. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, لا يجتمع أمتي على الضلالة أو لا تجتمع أو لا لا تجتمع أمتي على 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 الضلالة ما أمه never be will never come together on misguidance. Never will they come on misguidance. The Ummah of Islam, they will never come together on misguidance. So when Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu did what he did, all of the companions had ittifaq. All of them agreed with what he said. All of the all of the agree all of them agreed with what he said. The also the second fact and, and this is and this is and this is yes, I mean this is ijma. They all agreed and because they agreed on on right the mushaf, they, once once ijma has been, يعني لما نعقد الاجماع لا يجوز نقله. 
when ijma has been done, has been agreed upon, nobody can nullify it. The last point is al ala al jama'ah for the people to stay in a jama'ah, to be together, for Muslims to be together, okay? Which is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَشَاوِرْهُمْ فِي الْأَمَرِ And discuss your affairs with them. When a hadith would come, something big would come, the companions, they'll bring people, everyone who, who witnessed Badr, they'll come and they'll talk about the issue. What do you think? What do you think? What do you, that, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? Which is why you look at some Muslim countries when the ulama talk, they come together and say, okay, what is the, what do you think of this issue? What do you think? What do you think? Every island comes with different ideas and then after they come to an agreement on something. So when something happens in your community, you should I mean, speak to your masjid, what's happening, what's this, you know, is this correct, is it not correct? You shouldn't just go with your own you know, idea and think, okay, al ma'i, the haq is with me. No, ya al kareem even with Abu Bakr anhu, he asked many companions, or he asked the companions to do this. Umar told him, they all agreed. You know, it wasn't just, you know, it was like a dictatorial, you know, he just did what he liked. No, ya al kareem Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَشَاوْرٌ فِي الْأَمْرُ Speak to the people in your affairs. So whoever has fifth uh, uh, questions, we will commence now. And inshallah ta'ala, the Q&A will be for 15 minutes. فَلِيَتَفَضَّلُوا So um, one of the questions that the um, people of doubt always bring up, up with us is about the abrogated verses of the Qur'an. Mm -hmm. Could you shed some light upon that? What well, you mentioned that Abu Bakr had the Musaf and he gave it to Hafsa, then mm -hmm. Hafsa gave it to Uthman and mm -hmm. the Musaf that we today is known as the Uthmani Musaf. Mm -hmm. But we know there was abrogated verses and mm -hmm. people kind of use this to cast doubts, especially the Rafid the Shia, they say there's abrogated verses that would have solidified um, Ali's claim to the Khalafa, yet um, due to some type of conspiracy theory. Mm -hmm. um, is there any light you can shed on that or you want to wait till the next class? No, that's because fine. There's um, with regards to Nasr, with regards to abrogated verses, then an abrogated verse is, a, is an abrogation of a ruling. It's an abrogation of a ruling. So it's رفع خطاب رفع دليل شرعي بدليل شرعي آخر متأخر عن. It is the lifting of a دليل of a of 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 a دليل شرعي of an Islamic ruling by another uh, uh, ruling which comes after it. So, with regards to a nasr, if we look at a nasr, if we look at those ayat which were abrogated, they are, they are, not, they are not things which lead that, that even deal with this issue of wilaya and things like that. Islam, if you look at the Qur'an, where in the Qur'an does it, does it lead to, is, it, is, 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 is the issue of wilaya spoken about? or yani, ruling, or ruling has to be in this or that family. If the Qur'an had abrogated rulings, which yani, had within them, um, if you like, the fact that um, Ahlul Bayt should be in control of Islam or something like that, then we would have seen other ayat in the Qur'an which, 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 which come towards that, but there's nothing. That's the first thing. If you look at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Muslims to do, what he abrogated, he abrogated, for example, in Amal Fath, in the, in, the, in, 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 the, in the year of the conquest of Mecca, Mut'ah was allowed, and then after it was abrogated, for example. Okay? Um, the issue of, for example, in the early part of Al Islam, the, uh, they, had to face, they, they had to face Mecca, and then after, after facing Mecca, they had to face Al Aqsa, then Al -Aqsa. and then Allah Azza brought them back. You find that some of these things are tests for the Muslims, okay? Or another uh, ayah that was abrogated, which was in Sahih, that is in Sahih al Bukhari and Muslim, you will find that Aisha says a hadith, okay, about, for example, a woman who commits zina, that she's supposed to be punished in a certain way, yani, that she's supposed to be put inside the house and left there until she dies, or something like that. This was abrogated. Yani, the ahkam of the sharia. In the Quran, generally, when you look at the Quran, you don't see anything specifically speaking about wilayat or speaking about a ruling or, or a preference to another family over another. If Allah Azza wa was to do that, then there would have been iftirah, there would have been, there would have been, يعني, there would have been, if you like, there would have been separatism in the, in the, in the Islamic Ummah because if this, if, this, if this book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is supposed to be for all of mankind, then why is Allah Azza wa just speaking about one family only or talking about one family only? It, 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 people wouldn't accept it. 
Number two, Ahlul Bayt, يعني, people say, some ulama say, in Qaradu. Yani, in the sense where it is very fine, it's very hard to find who is Ahlul Bayt today anyway. Is it the Persians of Iran who are, who are Ahlul Bayt? I don't think so. Um, Ahlul Bayt is not only Fatima, radiallahu anha, and Ali. Ahlul Bayt is Abbas. Ahlul Bayt is Abdullah bin Abbas. How do people from Ahlul Bayt? It's not simply Fatima and Ali. So for this even to do, to say that Ahl al-Bayt is only them, is number one, is another thing which is wrong. Ahl al-Bayt is not just them. Another thing is that Ahl al-Bayt, in a specific degree, they had Wilaya the Abbas, the Abbasiyun. They were from they were the delivery of Al-Abbas, they had power in the earth. Okay? So it doesn't even make sense, I mean, this kind of thing that, yes, there is a hidden Qur'an, Mus'haf Fatima, the Mus'haf of Fatima. And all of this can farid, it's not, يعني, it's not true. So, and I don't really have as much knowledge on that issue, so I wouldn't be able to go in depth. You know, mashallah, there's maybe many more other suits of knowledge and things like that, and shayuf, who can go into depth, but that's just a basic answer. Barakallahu uh, feek. Any other question? The lecture today? The lecture that we went through. Okay, because what's funny is that I'm just saying sometimes. There's no question now, and then after when it's time for the speaker to walk out, I have a question. That's not Sid. That's not Sid. The Prophet ﷺ said, 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 the so if you have a question, ask it. Are we related to the topic or not related to the topic? So, study um, the, the 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 title of this lecture series is excerpts from the history of Islam, mm. and mashallah, I have a list of subjects you suppose you chose this specific one. Mm. What's the profound nature of this specific incident? Like, you know, I mean, the battle, the battles of apostasy, mm. and the compilation of the Quran. Why is such? Why is this such a monumental? incident in the history of Islam and how did it benefit Ummah? If it never happened, what would be our state now? If it never happened, then we could, you, somebody could even argue that would we even have a Mus'haf today? Everything happens for a reason. Everything happens for a reason. You see, uh, something may happen which is extremely sad and extremely difficult, but you find that the outcome is huge. So when you find, for example, that the companion, they had to make Hijrah. They had to make Hijrah. Huh? The Prophet said in the Hadith, or كما قال إني أرى في المنام إن يعني أنني أهاجر أو أنني سأهاجر. That I saw in a dream that I'm going to make Hijrah. He was forced to leave his home Mecca that he didn't want to leave. He went to Al Madina. As soon as he went to Al Madina, in the time span shorter than 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 the time Mecca, he had he he regained Mecca. He regained Mecca, and when Mecca was opened, he still went back to Al Madina. Okay. So what I'm trying to say to everyone here is that the fundamental nature of the compilation of the Qur'an is that if it wasn't for the death of those Qurra, of those people who died uh, fighting for the sake of Allah none of us here could be reciting the Qur'an. Those people died so that me and you today will be reciting the Qur'an. And if it wasn't for those people, then we wouldn't have the Qur'an between our, between our hands right here. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserves his book by way of these people. Which is why we should have love for the companions and not hatred for the companions. If yani, you know someone has done something for you, if you've ever been in debt or you've ever yani, fallen onto hard times or something like that, and then a person helps you at that particular time, you generally speak, you remember them for, the whole, for, your, for, for your entire life. You always be good to them, you remember them for what they did. So we should remember what these people have done that by way of them, after Allah this Qur'an was preserved. So we are indebted to them. So when we look at, when we have issues in our religion that we differ on, we should go back to them and not hate them the way some people want us to hate the, messen, uh, the companions of the Messenger of Allah.
the Quran is also known as the Musaf. Mm-hmm. Is the Quran known by any other name? Is the Quran known as any other name? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls it Al Furqan. So there are other names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, the criterion, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls it the Quran. He also calls it the Kitab, Had al Kitab ula Rayba fi, this book, there's no doubt in it. Yes, there's other names, but the name that the Muslims call it, generally speaking, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to call it, is the Quran. But yes, there are other names of the Quran. There are other names of the Quran. But um, these names you, uh, are names yani, that are not, you cannot compare them to the name of the Quran. In the sense where the, the, the word, the Quran, explains what it is in totality. Whereas the other words of the Quran are, if you like, characteristics of the Quran, the, the Furqan, the criteria. That's the characteristic of the Quran. But the name of the Quran, remember, what does the word Quran, the name Quran mean? In Arabic, to recite something, okay, the word is qara'a, to recite the verb. Qara'a, he read. If you want to say he is reading, yaqra'u, he read. There's a word that when you say the word, it's known as mustah. You, you're not talking about the action, the verb, shukran. You're not talking about the verb, you're talking about the word, but it's not the verb, not the mustah. You'll say al qiraa or Qur'anan, meaning a person is saying it off by head, reciting. So this is what the, what the Qur'an is, that which is recited, al-Qur'an. Because when you say qara'a, it means to what? To recite, to read. So the Qur'an is that which is read, that which is read, okay? So this is the word Qur'an, and it has other names, but those other names are characteristics of it. So the main name is the Qur'an, and that word is a complete expression of what the Qur'an is, if you like, if that even makes even, uh, if you like, sense. The Qur'an is the word of Allah, Azza It's the uncreated word of Allah. And when those are in Al-Furqan, and things like that, and the other kind of names of the Quran, uh, names of the Quran, those are, yani sifat, or the, those, those are expressions of what it is. Other names, yani that are expressions of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Next question. Can I ask them the Quran, the all that that is in the chapter? That they are uh, compiled in the Quran mm. is different to how it's revealed. How did they go about choosing which chapters come where? That's a very, very good question. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ, he actually said in a hadith, I mean a hadith, where he indicated to put the Quran in certain places. So there's a hadith right here, narrated by Imam Ahmad. And for those who don't know the Musnad of Imam Ahmad, uh, the rulings of Imam Ahmad in terms of how to pick a hadith are as strong as Bukhari and Muslim. They even say that Imam Ahmad in his Musnad, you may not even find a hadith, a hadith which is da'if. Or to find, for you to hear that there's a hadith which is da'if in the Musnad, in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad is very rare. It's not يعني, like Ibn Majah um, or, 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 or Tirmidhi, where you might find a few hadith or, or, or for example, al al uh, um, al Muslim Imam Ahmad is it is Sahih, and you know Ahmad Shaq talks about it. But he said, the Prophet said, "Da'u هذه الآيات في سورة التي يذكر فيها كذا وكذا." The Prophet ﷺ, he will say to the companions when they write them, "Put these, put these ayat in this surah." Not all the time, sometimes, but no, the compilation of the Quran is the way the companions compiled it. So it is done. Uh, if you like, if you see the surahs of the Quran. Um, this is this the, what they did in terms of compilation is some of it is for, in terms of the, the, the ayahs in the surah and that's from Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So all the surahs of Baqarah, there's no ikhtilaf. Is this surah uh, uh, Baqarah or not? There wasn't, it wasn't, you know what I mean, uh, this isn't Baqarah. They all agreed as Baqarah. But if you're saying Baqarah, Ali Imran, Kada wa Kada, then that's from the actions of Sahaba. And if you want to recite it differently, uh, for example, you want to recite Surah Al Nasir, you want to recite Surah Al Baqarah, there's no problem in that. But that is the way of the companions. But the companions, we don't ever say that they did anything from their own desires. There must have been something which made them put the Quran in that order. Even if we know, we don't know it because we said that as Sahaba, كلهم عدول. 
all of the companions are just and they were the most, they were the most knowledgeable. So the fact that they put it in that order, there's a hikmah behind it. And we should follow them. And the Muslims have followed them in the way in which they put the Quran in that order. Um, now, nah. so, yes. I've come across um, when you in sujood, you shouldn't decide. Yes. Where there is du'as that are within the Quran, for example, you can recite those. You can recite those. Yes, you can recite those. Yes, I feel it. So, so uh, you know, throughout the compilation of the Quran, mm -hmm. the surahs they've been given titles. Mm -hmm. So, in some compilations that I've seen from the time that I've seen some mm -hmm. Sahif, some surahs, not all of them, but some of them, the titles differ. They have like two to three titles different, for example, one time I saw mm -hmm. Mus'haf, Surah uh, Al-Furqan, mm -hmm. no, Surah Al-Isra, my apologies, uh, was also called uh, Surah Al-Bani Israel. Is there any... The naming of the Surah, the naming of the Surah, um, from what I know about the naming of the Surah, is that some, I think this may go down to the printer, so for example, some people they say, um, for example, They'll say Surah to Tabbat Yada. They won't give it the, it's the new name. Or they won't say Surah to Ikhlas. They'll just say read Surah to Qul Wallahu Ahad. Um, every name has this, has a, has a um, what do you call it? Has, every Surah has its name. Those people who name it something different, um, either it comes from their own Ijtihad, but um, the Surah's original name, as you see, it, is how is it supposed to be known with the Muslims. Those other Surah, those other words, Maybe because of the fact that in a particular part of the world that's what became known. But personally, I have to be honest with you. I can come back with that question, but wallahu a'lam. I have to be honest with you. I, I don't. I, I don't know. But we'll just give one more question because 15 minutes is up. So recently, we've been coming across a lot of um, individuals in the community. They claim to be from the Quran mm -hmm. and they, they say we don't need hadith. Mm -hmm. So you touched something. Uh, touched on something very early on in the lecture that. Um, without the hadith and the Quran, you know. I've got a beautiful story for that. Yeah. So we have we have right now in Luton mm -hmm. people doing dawah calling only to the Quran. Okay, excellent. They say we don't need hadith. Okay, this is what you guys do. Don't tell them. Say I wanna. Those people who are Quran you, this is what you do. Okay. Or they bring them to the masjid, the Quran you, and cook them a big meal, mashallah, and cook liver, and cook fish, cook liver. And cook fish okay I want you to cook liver and fish and watch them gobble down the liver and the fish and then after when you say to them brother it's haram what you've just eaten this is haram because Allah said Hurrimat alaykum al mayta well the, the ayah do you know the ayah Hurrimat alaykum maytati with demi with demi okay Allah has made haram mayta something which has been killed by not by not slaughtering it the fish has not been slaughtered so that's later what them liver is done is, is blood it's congealed blood why have you eaten the liver and the fish when the quran when 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 in islam in the quran allah says no they will, they will say nothing we will say the hadith is the delib is in the hadith of rasulullah it has been made halal for us to eat two kinds of dead things and and uh, and uh, two types of blood, okay. For amal meitatan, as for the meitatan, or for amal daman, as for the two bloods, al kabid liver wa tihal and the spleen. Wa amal wa amal meitadan, and for as for the two types of of of, of dead things, fal jarad grasshoppers, locusts, wal hoot, whale and all kinds of fish. So ask them now, don't buy fish and don't buy liver. But I guarantee they're buying fish and liver. So ask them, mashallah, how do they answer that question? And I guarantee you, because the Quran is knowing the Quran is saying you can eat liver or you can eat fish. Allah said, Mayta, Mayta is anything which has not been slaughtered. Fish has not been slaughtered. How can you eat fish? So I remember when somebody said that, I remember one sheikh, the Sudani sheikh in, uh, in Saudi, he said it. I was laughing when he said this to me. I haven't seen him since, you know. So subhanallah. But no, the Quran and the Sunnah are what are one. The Quran and Sunnah are one. A Sunnah to fasir al Quran. The Sunnah explains the Quran. Okay. Otherwise, 
How can you even explain the Quran without the Sunnah? How would you know anything about the Quran? How would you know you're supposed to pray five times a day without the Quran? Huh? How would you know certain issues relating to uh, inheritance without the Quran? Because certain things are found in the Sunnah. How do you know what to say? Subhana Rabbi al-A'la. Uh, how would you know to say that? Prophet said, فَأَمَّا فِي السُّجُودِ أَوْ كَمَا قَالْ فَعَذِّمُ فِيهَا الرَّبِّ then, then glorify Lord in sujood. Don't miss that Quran. How would you know that if it's not in the Sunnah? What are they saying in the Salawat al Khams? So, you know, um, a zakat, how, how would you know to give in zakat certain issues of gold and silver? How would you know how to give yani, zakat on hububi wa thimar? On certain, uh, if you like, um, yani, seeds and, and fruits. How would you give zakat on seeds and fruits? If you don't know, if you don't know it, you know. Um, so there's so many issues, you know. When Allah says, Allah has made bait halal and has made riba haram. How would you know riba from the sunnah? How would you know riba? What kind of riba? Where does riba enter into? What does riba not enter into without the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? So you don't have a leg to stand on. These, these people, يعني, they are... يعني شهوانيون يعني the word in Arabic شهواني is a person who has يعني too much energy to want to commit haram with a woman for example أخي الكلام ذي بده have so much energy just to run away from Al Islam they just don't want to implement Al Islam you know we saw Ibn Qayyim I'll end on this Ibn Qayyim he said this أهل السنة والجماعة يستدل ثم يعتقد أهل السنة they look into the Quran they say, okay, this is what the Quran says, we believe in it. So everything in the Quran, they believe in it. What Allah says, they believe in it. The people of desire, يعتقد ثم يستدل. They, they, they believe what they want to believe, and then after they try to find the that supports it. Which is why whenever you hear them, it's always strange stuff. It's never something which is in Islam that everyone knows. It's always strange stuff because they believe what they want to believe, and then they'll find something in the Quran to make them fit their narrative. Whereas Ahl al Sunnah al Jama'ah, they say, Do you believe in Allah? Wallahi, well, we believe in Allah. And Ahmadi, do you believe in Allah? Yes, I believe in Allah. He'll never tell his true belief until when he gets to know you. Ah, oh, there was another person after. He's never open. They always tell you secretly. Have a, this, this, inshallah, is the end of today. Inshallah, the chapter come next week, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, every week the lectures are more kind of intense, they're more intense subjects. So, inshallah, we look forward to seeing you next week. Barakallahu feek. Assalamu alaikum.